Say a few words. I'm going to say a little bit about. I'm going to do a previously on the Cambridge Climate Lecture Series, okay. and I'm going to ask people. There's two separate passwords there for the Wi-Fi. Yeah, so great. Hopefully, they should. Okay. Work. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Now, what? Um, uh, Welcome to the uh, Cambridge Science Festival on this Thursday night. This, um, this panel discussion is the fourth of a four lecture Cambridge climate lecture series, which has been going on in, in Cambridge for the last four weeks. And um, tonight we'll be summing up what has been said before. But I did want just to say that this um, lecture series came out of a meeting about a year ago when uh, the work of David Mackay was being honoured. He was present at the, at the meeting and then um, only a few weeks later he died. And David Mackay was a, a, an amazing proponent of numeracy in understanding climate and energy. And this lecture series is in his memory. I'd like to uh, get things kicking off with, uh, by introducing you to our host for tonight, and then he will introduce the panellists. The host is uh, Oliver Morton, who's a uh, briefings editor at The Economist. And Oliver, if you will then carry on. Sure. Thank you very much, you. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, and welcome to the, uh, the, the summing up of what we've seen over um, three previous evenings, and maybe even a, a taking forward. Um, just before I introduce the panel and get us on to various remarks, I thought I'd just ask for a quick show of hands. Am I reverberating in some peculiar way? <laughs> well, if I am, I'm sure someone will take care of it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, can we, I'd like a quick show of hands. Um, could you hold up your hand if you came to any of the previous lectures? Okay, and could you put down your hand unless you came to all the previous lectures? Okay, so we've got a small hardcore, but no one's, uh, but, but um, someone, someone at least can benefit from most of what I'm going to say now here, which is my, the bit where I put on a uh, previously on the Cambridge Climate Lecture Series voice um, and fill you in on all, on, on, on all the runners and riders. Generally, um, as you know, the theme of this is Paris to zero. How do we go? What's the path forward? And I think everyone has spoken here um, comes in to some extent with the view that 
in some way or other, Paris deserved its reputation as being something of a success. It definitely, uh, I think, uh, I think three of us were in Paris. Were you in Paris? Yes, three, three of us were in Paris um, and and had our own experiences of of, of, of that of, of that time. But it's fairly clear that Paris provided the world with a new political diplomatic framework for dealing with these issues that was significantly better in many, by many different measures than what had gone before. That was a success. It also had, um, but it had a greater sort of like success of the spirit in that one did come away from Paris feeling that there was a sense that the world in general was on or willing to imagine itself on, or genuinely wanting to be on, some sort of pathway to greatly reduced or indeed zero emissions. So that's where we, that's where we start from. The question that uh, was put before us by tonight's issues is, what is the pathway? What pathway are we actually following? What are the roadblocks on the pathway? Um, and with what urgency must we pursue the pathway that we choose? How fast do we go? How steep is it? Um, what lurks in the woods to either side? Um, and the three bit talked so far in the series um, have, have taken different views of it. Um, Brian Worthington, um, who was one of the architects of the um, Climate Change Act in Britain, um, provided a talk about the, the path as a race between politics and physics, pointing out that um, despite the discovery of many new planets these days, none of them are really in a position to um, provide us with much sucker should we run out on this one. Um, she identified three sorts of, uh, of, of blockage that we might worry about on these paths, um, which you can call the three tragedies. The tragedy of the commons, this sense that if you are in an unregulated place where everybody is able to do what they want and nobody fully bears the responsibilities, you get messy, unsatisfactory outcomes. She also talked about the tragedy of the horizon, which is a term that's been brought into this debate largely by Mark Carney of the Bank of England. This idea that um, the time horizons for talking about climate change are very poorly suited, very poorly matched to the time horizons with which we deal with other political um, and policy issues. Um, there's a line from the German climate impacts researcher, John Schellner, where he says, the problem with climate change is that by the time you really believe in it, it's too late to do anything about it. That's sort of like the tragedy of the horizon. The other one was what I think you might call the tragedy of success, which is that although it is easy um, to demonize and sometimes I think probably appropriate to demonize the fossil fuel industry, one has to bear in mind quite what a huge industry it is in terms of, among other things, human potential and human resources. Um, and particularly, as Brian said, to some extent, the welfare state is built on taxes from the fossil fuel industry. That doesn't mean the fossil fuel industry gets a free pass, but it does mean that you need to think hard about how you scale it back without scaling back some of the welfare and indeed some of the tax revenue that's associated with it. Which led us to the second talk. Now, unfortunately, no one from Carbon Track, um, where, which is the place where Anthony Hobley worked, who gave the second talk, is able to be with us tonight, which is very unfortunate. Um, but he was talking also about the fossil fuel industry and about the great bind that to follow one of the pa Paris pathways that we wish to follow, we need to cap emissions at around 900 or 800 um, gigatons left of carbon. Um, and if you look at the amount of carbon that's in the inventories of the world's fossil fuel industries, there's about three times that. There's just shy of, uh, of 3,000 gigatons. What to do about that? And Anthony had a lot of different um, points to make about how the fossil fuel industry is not really facing up to this and is not um, understanding either the powerlessness of its uh, insistence that it is going to get those 3,000 um, gigatons out of the ground and also not understanding the heartening speed with which it is being made redundant um, by, the, by the renewable energy industry. And so pointing out that, for instance, Exxon says that in 2040, 11% of global power will be produced by um, renewable energy of all sorts, whereas the analysis from Carbon Tracker, which is available in a very nice report called Expect the Unexpected, 
which I urge you to download. It's, it's absolutely fascinating stuff. Their expectation is that by 2040, fully 25% of the world's uh, energy needs could be being taken care of by solar and maybe up to 30% by 2050. And so to a large extent, Anthony's um, presentation was rather optimistic. He was saying that the physics as usual um, uh, pathways that we look at really aren't going to happen and that the momentum was now with the renewable energy industry and things were going to get a lot better than people had seen and the important task ahead of us and ahead of us in policy terms was how to get rid of the fossil fuel industry without destroying the value in that industry which as he pointed out is sort of like embodied in things like pension funds and things. we don't want to just destroy that capital we want to redeploy it to a sustainable green healthy energy economy i think the drawback and i'm fairly sure that others on the panel would agree with me to that analysis was that even in this sunny world of 30 percent solar power in 2050 the chances of staying below 2.7 degrees celsius were only two in three which is not very good when you consider that what the paris agreement wants is for us to keep below two degrees celsius and ideally as close as possible to 1.5 degrees celsius and the third of the speakers that we've heard so that we've heard so far in this series and I should stress that all these talks are very much worth your while and still available on the internet. The third of our uh, speakers, was Kevin Anderson, was, I think, more at pains than any of the others to stress quite how huge the challenge of getting to two degrees, let alone 1.5 degrees, actually is. And one of the points that he made, and I'm sure we'll uh, make again this evening, and we can, we can go into that, is the degree to which there's, I think he called it a surrealism, um, all under the influence of Paris and the art world, um, a surrealism to the idea that we will rest our climate hopes, our climate policies, on technologies that we do not actually have, specifically what are called negative emissions technologies for sucking carbon dioxide that we've already emitted back out of the air and a lot of the analysis at paris is based on the possibility of those technologies but they are not very explicitly discussed and the costs that they impose in terms of specifically land use change are very little discussed so i would say uh, though he might disagree with me that um kevin was but to some extent the least optimistic of the three speakers but he was also in a way the one the one who gave you the most forceful vision which is that whatever happens now the world as we knew it is gone the world is changed either it is changed through the deep pervasive societal action that is taken to avert climate change or it is changed by that climate change itself. So that I think gives you a, a sense of previously on the CCLS. Um, I should say, I should have said this at the very beginning, please have your mobile phones on silent, but should you feel um, the urge to tweet about this fine event, you have a hashtag just there to assist in this process. And people who are watching us through a live stream Maybe through that camera there, I don't know. No, through that camera there. Uh, people who are watching through a live stream can also tweet in. You can also can tweet in questions, which through a miracle of modern technology involving um, little paper cards, I may at some point get to see. Um, and indeed, if you are in the audience but shy, you could always tweet us your questions here, but there will be microphones. Um, that's when we get to that part. First, we're going to have a bit of a panel discussion, and as well as the three panelists, as well as the two panelists who've given previous talks, um, Brian and Kevin, we're joined by two other um, respondents this evening um, who one might say um, sit at um, uh, different poles on the index of venerability. Um, <laughs> uh, Martin, Martin Rees um, on one pole needs um, really especially in this town and in this place uh, where I first saw him on this stage over 30 years ago um, <laughs> really no introduction, but if you want it, uh, Martin is a former president of the Royal Society, former Master of Trinity, he is the Astronomer Royal, he is um, Britain's most notable astrophysicist, he is a best-selling author, and um, he 
is an all-round good egg. Um, <laughs> Martin will speak first, and then after that, we're um, joined by Jean Martin, who is Belgian, Swiss, and French, but really Bruxellois. Uh, Bruxellois. Um, she's uh, worked in. Uh, she's uh, done. Uh, worked at, in environmental economics, um, taking a degree first at the LSE and. Um, then at uh, Imperial, and she's now working with Share Action on investor on responsible investment uh, regimes, and she's also been um, a youth delegate at the last four, is it right, four meetings and intersessionals of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. So what we're gonna do now is Martin and Jan will give us some of their responses to the talks earlier in the series, and also I suppose their, their general position on the subject. We'll then ask Kevin and Bryony to say whether they or I have traduced them in any way and amplify anything that they want there. We'll then have, I think, a little bit of back and forth here on the stage, and then we'll throw it open to you, and we'll all be um, through and ready to go to the pub by about 8 o'clock or not long thereafter. So, with that said, Martin, I wonder if you'll kick us off. Yes. Well, I've got to climb out of my grave first. <laughs> that, right? Okay. Um, well, thank you very much, uh, Oliver. Um, I'd like uh, uh, first to say how much I admired the three lectures we had early. Um, and uh, uh, thinking about my general attitude, um, I want to say first why this is such a wickedly hard problem. The first reason, obviously, is that any effective action has to be global. The CO2 that we put out has no more effect here in Australia and vice versa. So it's got to be a global policy. But more important is what uh, Brownie highlighted, the problem of the horizon. And this is, in a sense, the question of how far ahead we are prepared to plan. And just to say a word about this, this really is related to the amount of discounting we use. And having uh, heard the talks and read quite a bit about this subject, I've realized that the disputes about the policies we should adopt are only to a minor extent, except in the case of a few people, concerned with disputes about the science. Most people accept the IPCC range of projections, but the differences in view stem from differences in how far ahead we should plan. To take one example, someone who's often regarded as a bogeyman in this context is Born Lomberg, um, of the Copenhagen Consensus of Economists. And uh, uh, what he does is he says that uh, dealing with climate change now is low priority c compared to other ways of having the world's poor. And uh, we should do other things first. But the reason he comes to that conclusion is that he discounts the future at the standard rate you would if you're making a business decision to put an office block or something. And if you take a standard discount rate, then what happens beyond 2050 doesn't really count for much. And of course, before 2050, then we can cope, in most cases, with uh, uh, what's going to stem from climate change. If you don't consider anything beyond a 2050 horizon, then you will not prioritize climate change as much as most of the rest would want to. On the other hand, if you take the view which uh, uh, Stern and Weizmann and most policies, the, the policy led to our Climate Change Act, uh, uh, assumed, then you do in effect take a lower discount rate and you are prepared to pay an insurance premium now to remove a risk from people living at the end of a century. Another way to put this is that you don't discriminate on grounds of date of birth. You care about the life chances of someone just born now as much as of someone who is already middle-aged. And this is the kind of policy uh, um, assumption which has to be incorporated in any theory which is going to make you take climate change action very seriously. If you discount the future beyond 2050, you know. And of course, the trouble is that in most political decisions, people don't think long term enough. Uh, we can't plan energy policy 30 years ahead. There's only one case where we do have a, a long term discount uh, uh, rate, and that is in disposing of radioactive waste, where people talk seriously about is the repository safe for 10,000 years. That's the only context I know in public policy where people in effect apply a zero discount rate. And my point is they've got to apply a low discount rate in order to uh, realize 
that we have to pay this insurance premium now for the benefit of people alive at the end of the century. Well, what should happen? Uh, all the things discussed at the Paris conference and which were discussed uh, by the other lecturers. Um, I'd just like to highlight one other uh, positive outcome of the Paris conference. This was um, an agreement spearheaded by the United States and India, although David King of this country played a great role in initiating it. And this was a declaration by at least 20 countries to double their publicly funded R&D into clean energy. And this commitment was uh, uh, paralleled by a commitment by Bill Gates and a few other philanthropists that they would also uh, fund more uh, high-risk uh, uh, explorations of clean energy <laughs> options. I think this is important because the main worry is that most of the re remedies for dealing with climate change um, have some downsides, whereas this doesn't have any downsides. And the main point is that if we can increase the rate of R&D into all kinds of clean energy and complementary techniques like batteries, energy storage, and smart grids and all these things, then we bring nearer the day when clean energy is affordable and effective. And then we bring near the day, therefore, when India, where they clearly need energy so that people don't depend on uh, uh, stoves burning wood or dung, India won't have to build coal-fired power stations, but will be able to afford to go directly to clean energy. And it would be hard to think of a more inspiring uh, goal for young engineers than to accelerate the availability of clean, affordable energy in the developing world. So that was another very instructive um, and uh, encouraging outcome of the Paris Conference. Now, what will actually happen? Here I'm rather a pessimist because, of course, the extractive technologies um, are rather futuristic. And if you ask what I think is going to happen, I think that CO2 annual emissions globally will not go down in the next 20 years. They may even go up. And 20 years from now, we'll have a longer time base of data. We have better theory. And we will know the important fact of the so-called climate sensitivity. We will know uh, whether the climate uh, is changing fast in a scary way, or whether we are at the low end, which the so-called lukewarmists say is going to mean we don't need to react too fast to it. We will know the answer. Well, if the lukewarmists are right, that's good news. But if they're wrong, then we will realize it's almost too late to do anything. And then there will be pressure for panic measures. And those panic measures will, of course, include geoengineering, not just the extractive uh, kind of geoengineering, which everyone thinks is benign, because that's just sort of undoing the geoengineering we've done by putting the CO2 in the atmosphere in the first place. Uh, but uh, we will have to consider uh, solar radiation management, so-called, which means changing the uh, uh, upper atmosphere to change the amount of uh, solar energy getting down to the Earth. And um, although I'm in favor of this being studied, I think uh, uh, the implementation of this is scary. It's feasible, it's almost too cheap. It could be done by a single corporation, probably, not just a nation state. And, of course, uh, the consequences are unpredictable. And uh, uh, we probably won't understand the atmosphere well enough to be confident of what the consequences will be. And uh, I fear that the only beneficiaries of this will be the international lawyers. Because if you can have litigation about the weather uh, between different nations, then this is a real bonanza for them, but this is going to happen, uh, be a consequence. So uh, I think if we do nothing in 20 years, then if the climate is changing fast, the repression of geoengineering, uh, which of course is only a temporary palliative anyway, um, and uh, uh, would lead to all these problems. My final point is, how can we get this issue high on the agenda so that we have a chance of uh, implementing CO2 reductions quickly enough to stay below two degrees? I think the main point is to maintain pressure on politicians. As Oliver said, at the time of Paris and soon afterwards, there was a quasi-euphoria, as it were, because there was a lot of interest in climate change. People thought things are happening. But I think that's rather faded now. And 
this is natural because politicians and the public have urgent parochial things to worry about. And they worry about those rather than the global long-term issues. We need to ensure that politicians take more seriously these long-term issues. Well, I think uh, one example which I think helped in the lead up to the Paris conference was the input of the Pope. Now, I'm not a fan of the Catholic Church in particular, but I think there's no doubt that the papal encyclical was hugely important and a very positive input in the lead up to the Paris conference because of the huge influence of the Pope in uh, Latin America, uh, in Africa and East Asia uh, in particular, and because whatever you think about the Catholic Church, no one can deny um, it's, it's a, a long-term view, it's concerned about the world's poor. And the papal encyclical, which had a very positive reception, the Pope had a five-minute standing ovation at the UN, that I think had a big effect. Well, that just means that public attitudes can be influenced uh, by opinion leaders, and of course, the Pope is a, is a leader of a million uh, Catholics, and there are other people whose opinions are valued. And this leads me to think that um, public interest, and this is a, a mini manifestation of that, the fact that everyone is here tonight, is important because politicians listen a bit to scientific advisors. I mean, I know people who've been government science advisors, and they always grumble that they have limited traction. But what politicians listen to more is what's in their inbox or what's in the press. And so I think if we can ensure that there is a lot in their inbo inbox, there's a lot in the press about climate issues, then they will respond, they'll keep these things high on the agenda, they have much higher chance of achieving the kind of goals which uh, Brian and Kevin discussed in their lectures. So let me finish with that. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. I think, you're, I think you're probably quite right about um, science advisors and such, but I do remember thinking of the reason why we're here. A nice story from uh, Chris Hoon, who was the energy minister um, under, in the coalition uh, for, its first, for the first few years, um, who, whose science advisor was David McKay. Mm. And how very worried his civil servants were when he suggested that, David should, that he should have a monthly meeting with David that didn't have an agenda where David would just advise him. And the, the, the civil servants were very concerned about this yeah, possibility because yeah, yeah. they might just get honest advice yes. from David. Yes, and so David's influence was more through his book and uh, I think that's the global probably, readership of that than through being an advisor. Well, among other things, the reason that David was, was the scientific advisor was his book. That, yes, you know, yeah. the book what made him sure. think. Anyway, um, please go and buy the book if you haven't already. And if you can't buy the book, then download it for free. Mm -hmm. But it's a wonderful book. It's a lovely physical object. It's a great download. It's still a wonderful read. Jeanne, if you'd like to yeah. say some remarks. Thank you, Oliver. Um, I'd like to make two key comments. Uh, and then I'll ask two questions to the other panelists, if so that's okay. Uh, my comments refer to the importance of timing and the rise of full solutions. Um, as a young person, I feel that I've heard the same message all my life, um, that we need to act on climate change and we need to add, act now to avoid its most disastrous impacts. Unfortunately, governments have failed to listen to scientific warnings and the pace of action has been way too slow. And here we are in, as Brian e. correctly labeled it, the age of consequences. A situation where we only have five years um, to remain below 1.5 degrees. Five years. And achieving this target is crucial for climate justice. Because although climate change is often framed as an environmental problem, it is inherently a social one. It has the potential to exacerbate every existing inequality and swipe years of development efforts. In 2014, the Republican, uh, the Republican Dominic, Dominican Republic, sorry, um, was decimated by a natural hazard, and it was estimated that it would take 25 years to rebuild its infrastructure and attain the same development level as before. Yet, in the current political context, it has become radical to speak honestly about climate change and its impact. It has become radical to care about people impacted by climate change. 
I was reading an article by Asad Rehman the other day, which said that last year the Pakistani government dug graves in anticip anticipation of heat waves induced death. And these heat waves are only going to be made worse by climate change. So how is it radical to want to prevent such situations from happening? And this brings me to my second point, the existence of full solutions. As Kevin clearly said, we have fine-tuned our analysis to align with, econ with economic and political sensibilities. We rely on technologies that either don't exist or have not been proven at the commercial scale yet. Let me take the example of CCS, or carbon capture and storage. It's a, a technology that aims at capturing CO2 from the atmosphere, transporting it, and injecting it in geological reservoirs, where it is believed that the CO2 will remain for centuries. Last year, I worked as a research assistant at Imperial College. I researched the economic uncertainty surrounding CCS costs. And what struck me most was the following. When I spoke to investors, or pe people working in the financial sector, they would laugh at me and say that this technology was way too risky to invest in. Dr. Charles Donovan from Imperial Business School said that, it would, that investors would need at least to wait at least 25 years to consider investing in this technology. On the contrary, both scientists and politicians assumed that CCS was going to work, was going to be cheap, and was going to be deployed on time. These assumptions were never questioned. But the extremely so slow pace of deployment of large-scale CCS projects has led the International Energy Agency to revise its deployment estimates from 100 CCS projects by 2020 to 30 CCS projects by 2020. That's a 70% reduction. And as Anthony Hobley said in his lecture, current scenarios assume that we'll have 3,800 CCS projects by 2050 to decarbonize our economies. So clearly, we're currently relying on an expensive technology in which the market does not even believe in. As I said before, time is limited, and we don't have the luxury of relying or betting on false and unproven solutions. The good news, the good news is that proven solutions do exist, and they're only waiting to be implemented. But they're at the mercy of political changes. These changes include the recent rise of far-right populism and the negotiations of international trade deals. And that's where my question comes in. I believe that the rise of far-right populism can, can have a negative impact on climate change for the following two reasons. Firstly, it fuels a climate of hate and nationalism, which is not conducive to international collaboration. But we need international collaboration to ta tackle climate change on time and in a matter that is fair and just. We need international collaboration to ensure that technology and funds are channeled to most vulnerable nations, to enable them to mitigate their emissions and adapt to the worst impacts of climate change. And secondly, far-right populism doesn't go well with climate change because far-right politicians don't really care about climate change. Um, and as, as seen recently by the recent election of um, the new US president, years of climate efforts can be dismantled in a second. Um, the second type of political change is the negotiation of international trade deals, such as CETA, TISA, TTIP, you name it. These trade deals can also have a very negative impact on the climate. Firstly, um, because they encourage the lowest level of ambition. So imagine you have two countries, one of them with very strong climate policies, and the second one with very weak climate standards. CO2 is not priced yet, which means that you're not rewarded if you include the cost of emitting CO2 in the production of your good. That means that if you allow those countries to trade together and freely and not add any, anything to, retra to restrict <laughs> those trade flows, then the producer taking climate change into account is going to be put at a disadvantage because it's going to cost more for him to produce that good. So if you implement those trade deals and force the two, those two nations to trade together, the producers that produce the most expensive goods are going to lose revenues and they're going to lobby their governments to reduce the, their climate standards until it matches the one of the other trading partner. The second argument uh, Behind the, between the link 
between international trade deals and climate change is that there's often a little clause in those trade deals that allow corporations to sue governments if they implement social, environmental, or climate policies that are seen to damage competitiveness. And that has happened in the past. For example, the Quebec government wanted to ban fracking in Quebec, but then Lone Pine, a mining company, um, decided that it was going to damage its competitiveness, went to court, um, won, and the Quebec government was unable to prevent fracking from happening in its own lands. So my question to you is, how can we, as citizens, and how can political parties fight against these political changes and ensure that we move in the right direction? Thank you. Thank you. Bryony, I'd, I'd like to turn to you first on that one for obvious reasons. You said some interesting things in your talk about um, the race to the top um, and about the way in which when Britain framed the Climate Change Act, there was a feeling not only of taking on Britain's historical responsibilities in the area, but also providing something that other people could step up to. And indeed, we have seen similar climate legislation in a growing number of other countries. But how do we keep that happening, especially in, this, in, 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 in the world of increased right-wing pop populism that Jeanne points to? Thank you, and uh, thank you to the two respondents. Um, it's nice to be back in Cambridge. Um, <laughs> Well, um, that, like, that was a, it's a tough question, but what I can say is that if you, if you take a step back and see what's happening today, it's, it's the return swing of a pendulum. And essentially, we've, we've got this rise in right-wing populism, possibly because we've had a period of relative uh, dominance of, of centre-right or centre-left liberalism. And if you talk to Republicans in the United States, um, they, they feel as passionately that Obama was bad for America as Democrats feel Trump is bad for America. And so there's a pendulum swing that swings, especially in the States, it's very marked in the States, but it happens in other countries, between conservatism and liberalism. And we're on the swing towards uh, conservatism at the moment. Now these swings are actually quite short term in the grand scheme of things. I mean, Martin's talked about some of the timescales that we're looking at. And it's very, it's very easy to get caught up in the day-to-day -day minutiae of how terrible Trump is and how awful it's going to be that he's going to wreck everything. But in, in actual fact, what I think we're going to see is that the, his role has got limits. And although he's a bull in a china shop, the china shop itself, as in the Constitution of the United States and the, and the, and the institutions that the United States has created, are strong enough to withstand the next four to eight years of his destructive activity. So I, I would say, yes, we should be concerned, absolutely, but it's not, every action has a reaction. And you'll see in Holland just, just yesterday that there was a polarization towards the more radical left, actually, as a result against, you know, kicking off against the right wing rise. So, so it, it's, it's definitely a worrying trend, but I have faith that this pendulum will keep swinging, but actually what we're seeing is in some ways a reflection of how far we've come that the, the rise of the, the anger in the right is because the left seems to be so dominant. And Paris is part of that. Do you find it hard to reconcile the strong things you say about the age of consequences with the slightly longer perspective that you offer when saying things like that? When, uh, because, you know, for, you know, four years, eight years, pretty soon we're talking real money. Um, sure, but in those four to eight years, um, it's not as if action to tackle climate change is going to stop because the, outside the world of politics, there's an awful lot of activity and, and I'm, I'm sure if Anthony were here, he'd tell you that the amount of green bonds being issued, the amount of investment going into seeking out positive projects to be invested in is increasing. And the general sentiment that Paris created was, oh, okay, this is serious, right? The world's taken this seriously. And that has a ramification through corporate boardrooms globally, which then starts to tip decisions into the right things. There are also other aspects beyond politics, such as the, the religious interest in this great gaining ground. And, and I, would, I would just say that there's a, you know, we, we are at the, at the moment in probably some of the darkest days in terms of Trump's administration. But even in America, look at what California's doing. California's now saying, well, you know, you want to dismantle EPA, you're going to have to reckon with us. And, and California's the strongest part of the US economy. So, you know, the, the, it's not, we're not, it's not a, nothing has, uh, a, 
really fundamentally changed the fact that action on climate change is underway and has been underway since I would say we started taking it seriously in around the 1990s and, and hopefully that pace of action is increasing. Kevin, could I come to you on that? Mm. Uh, Kevin, I'm coming to you on that. Yeah, I'm <laughs> I think I have some disagreements with Brian's perspective on this, a little bit anyway. I'm not sure, firstly, I think the pendulum swings from, from the left to the right, if we're going to call it like that. But whilst, as it has swung from the left to the right, we have chosen to ignore a significant swathe of our society, both in the States, class, you know, simplified as a cliche sense of the Dust Bowl, or indeed in, in, the, in the Europe and you see it in the UK, significant swathes of people who have not done well out of globalization. So left-leaning woolly liberals like me have not cared enough about that constituency for a very long time. And what slightly concerns me, as soon as they get a voice, we call it populism. Mm -hmm. and it's been, I think it's been, you know, we've been very derogatory about that particular group. I'm not saying you did that, but I think we are often. I also think that they did not vote for Trump. They voted against the Democrats, against Clinton. And actually, I think if Sanders had stood, he would have been a genuine alternative to the establishment. Trump clearly is not an alternative to the establishment. He was, a, you know, he was born as a millionaire, so he's barely you know, not part of the establishment. As Sanders would have been a genuine alternative. I think people voted for Trump because he was, between the two, he cleared, between Clinton and, and him, he was clearly an alternative. And this group wanted to kick, kick back against a system that had not cared about them for a long time. And I think to some extent that's the same thing that's happened with Brexit. Now, the, there is a way then to turn that around and say, why, one of the reasons this, this, this significant spread of society that I think is being misclassified as, 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 as right wing, um, as the majority of them anyway, have been concerned is because of issues to do with employment. The great thing about if you are genuinely serious about shifting to a, a, a low carbon society within the time frame, within the horizon we have, then it is an absolute agenda for jobs. You are guaranteed in full employment for the next 30 years if we think climate change is a serious issue. If we don't, we can carry on with structural unemployment. Um, but if we think it's a serious issue, whether it's building renewables or whether it's retrofitting our houses or electrifying our infrastructure, uh, across the board, we have 30 years of, of, full, you know, of um, full employment if we're to deliver on that. So you could actually start to think of the concerns that this group rightly have had, whether in the States or in the UK, or indeed sometimes within the rest of Europe, um, the, those concerns align, I think, quite well with a genuine commitment and agenda for delivering on the Paris two degree C commitment. So I think you can, you can reshape this. And I think, I think if the left was a bit more inventive, it might have actually tried to do this. It could have reshaped this as a, a more positive agenda. And I'm someone who's saying that generally doesn't see things in a particularly positive light, but I think this is one we could be using. But a bit like the banking crisis of 2007, when we should have, we should have basically kicked out the economists then, at least the conventional form of them, and come up with an alternative model. Instead, we've just lightly regulated the city and nothing's gonna change. So we lost that opportunity to think differently about society. My concern is we're gonna lose this opportunity to think differently about society again. I do not want to wait for the pendulum just to swing back again. Because remember, we did nothing on climate change during Obama. And actually, disturbingly, though, I'm all in favor of the Climate Change Act, the UK hasn't really either. I mean, our emissions haven't really come down if you take um, consumption-based emissions into account and if you ignore the, um, the downturn from 2007. From that point of view, our emissions per capita have not changed very much um, over the last... No, but in actual terms, they have changed, and there has been a big shift. I mean, not in terms we, of lifestyles. No, but, well, but, no, but our lifestyles are fueled by the energy choices that our energy companies make, and the governments have intervened, successive governments have intervened, to change the energy mix that we all rely on. Now, if it's a sunny, windy day in Britain, you're down at you know, 150, 200 parts per, per, of CO2 per kilowatt hour, and that is a significant drop from the... 600 that we were at just a few years that's ago. That's for electricity, which is 20% of the energy sure, we consume. But let's As we fly off to give another talk with our, with our you know, Whittle jet engine from 1936, they're the pinnacle of pumping CO2 into the atmosphere. But you know that once you've decarbonized electricity, it's a massive gateway to decarbonizing the other energy sectors. Not so, in the time frame. Well, it, no, it, it can't. Well, it, it can be if we have the right amount of will yep. and the right amount of money to spend it. it it's, you know, let's not fall into the trap of thinking everything's hopeless because actually we have made progress in the UK and we've demonstrated that we can grow the economy, albeit a bit sm slower than perhaps we estimated, whilst decoupling our carbon emissions. Well, I would say rhetorically, I think, I agree. I think the, the rhetoric is really good in the UK and I don't mean that in a negative sense. I mean, rhetoric is important. It's a prelude to action. 
And I think the UK, I, I genuinely mean this as a positive comment, the rhetoric in the UK has been appropriate for a long time. I have to say at the moment, I think it has softened quite a lot with the current government. And I think that rhetoric is important. But we've had it for a long time. We now need to see the action. I do not think we've seen much in the way of judicious climate change action within the UK. Certainly nothing in line with what we necessary to deliver on Paris. Martin, I think. Yes. Well, I was going to ask, what about a uh, realistic climate, sorry, carbon tax and the idea of the sort of club of nations and a tariff on outsiders? This would be effective, wouldn't it? And it's not crazy to believe no, that would happen. And there's quite a lot of interest in that, even even in, in Republican-controlled America, where Exxon, actually, knowing that they're going to be first in line when it comes to litigation, have said, we well, should have a carbon tax. And, you know, that that is not insignificant. China is already introducing emissions pricing through its trading scheme. It could easily flip that into a tax. Europe's already got a significant carbon tax. Britain's got one of the best taxes in the world. You know, there is potentially a club of nations forming who have internalized the price who will use that as a for, as a trade um, uh, agreement. So that's definitely possible within quite short time scales. I would, again, I, I'm not a great fan of taxes. I, I'm not that I'm a taxes, not of a carbon tax. The problem with the, uh, depends how you do it, and the devil is in the detail. If you took the sort of fee and dividend approach, whereby you collect all the money related, relative to how much energy people consume or carbon-based energy they consume, then you distribute that income out evenly then perhaps that's okay. The problem with the carbon tax, but it means that people like me, people, most, most of us on the panel, you not yet, but you're aspiring to be there, we're inelastic to the price of energy. You put up the price of energy, we just pay it. It doesn't make a difference, we'll still fly, we'll still drive our big cars, live in our big houses. We'll carry on doing that, the poor won't. The poor will suffer poorer quality houses and bronco problems in the short term. So we have to find a way of compensating for all that. So whilst the tax can be appropriate, I think we have to be very careful that it can also be very inequitable. We, most of us who are wealthy and high emitters like a tax because we know we do not have to change our lifestyle because we'll afford the tax. The tax is important for the supplier because for the supplier's point of view, the tax can yes. make, make the difference between the moving between one form of technology and another, a lower carbon form. So mm. on the supply side, I think a tax can have a really important role. On the consumer side, for us, I think it's actually probably quite regressive. But, but that, you know, with all due respect, um, that is exactly what you know, how we're doing the taxes at the moment. We're paying carbon prices at, in the UK, an £18 uplift on the EU price, which we've taken on voluntarily, mm. and that is redistributed into um, the welfare payments that we make. So, you know, it's, it's and the Treasury's happy because that means they can afford the welfare bill. So it, it is being redistributed. It's not being distributed equally. It's being distributed in a positive way against... Okay, so, you know, it does work. And you're, the po point you made, which is exactly right, is that where it matters is in the boardroom. Mm. When you decide yeah. between that project, which is now going to not clear it and wash its face because it's facing a carbon penalty, and this project, which is making lots of money because it's attracting a subsidy. All oh, right, well, I'll do that one. Yeah. That's why it's important. I must say, I, 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 the, the cynic in me thinks that any climate action program which is backed by Exxon um, may not be necessary, and the, specifically for the reasons that Kevin, that Kevin put, which is that when Exxon backs the carbon price, they know that it will hit coal, and that's great. And there has been a massive damage to the coal industry, which I think most of us, not all of us, but most of us feel quite good about, but that they think that if the carbon price comes to affect the price of fuel, then as Kevin says, people will largely pay it. Um, We've got an example of this in California where it's not just on coal, it's mm. on everything. The whole of the Californian economy is subject to a carbon cap and that covers mm. fuel. And it, it's, it's doing exactly what you expect to do. It's finding the least cost solutions, it's kicking out the, the easiest things to kick out. And Exxon will, they won't be the first in the line, but they'll get hit by it. The, I mean, it's, it's uh, you right to, right to be cynical about mm. them, but equally, um, it's a really important thing. If that if they're embedded into this Republican administration, and they are the only voice of reason, it sounds as if they are one of the few. Um, you shouldn't, you know, should take that for what it's worth. I wonder if anyone else wants to come back on the uh, question that Jean raised about the spectacular mismatch between how academics in the climate change community and politicians and I think to some extent journalists talk about CCS and how people who might have to act, this is carbon capture and storage technologies, and how people who might actually invest in carbon capture and storage show every ability not to do so and have been showing that ability not to invest in carbon capture and storage now for quite some time. Mm. Um, well, there was a report that the UK government done by uh, Ron Oxborough, who's a real expert on these, and what he said uh, was that it would only be viable 
if the government paid for the infrastructure. I guess that means the, the pipes from the power stations to the depositories. Um, otherwise, it won't be economically sensible. And of course, the government then um, said they wouldn't pay for that. And that's, I think, one of the things that has stymied the uh, test projects in this country. Um, but uh, uh, I think that's just saying that it doesn't seem economic unless part of the burden is uh, paid by the public sector. There's also a couple of other things about it. But the, the only CCS plant, carbon capture storage plant, that's actually on a power station, um, it's been done elsewhere, like the Sleipner field in, in, in Norway, but actually on a power station that's run for a few years now, as far as I'm aware, and I know John's there, I know, so you can tell me if I'm wrong, I think is the Boundary Dam project in mm -hmm. Canada. It's the only one that's run, and I think that's been run for about two years, and it has only captured, it's captured less than half the CO2 that they thought it would capture as a pilot plant. Now, I think this is the only one that exists so far. It's 110 megawatts, which is about one-tenth the size of a, of a decent well, size thermal power right. station. Yeah. So it's one-tenth, and it has been very, very difficult to operate technically. Now, I'm sure the engineers will be able to resolve the problems around it. Nevertheless, it does show there are, there are a suite of quite difficult issues to do with carbon capture stories that need to be dealt with, which are not actually thought about in terms of the BEX side when you had biomass in there. Because at the moment, some of the problems are being related to some of the chemical components of, of so coal. Can you, can you just pull back and explain a little bit more about what BEX oh, is? BEX is when you, you grow plant material, uh, trees or miscanthus, grasses and so forth, and as they grow, they absorb carbon dioxide through photosynthesis. You then capture those and you harvest them and then you burn them in your power stations. And as you burn them in the power stations, you capture the carbon dioxide and you liquefy it and store it underground somewhere for a long time. And by the photosynthesis, sucking the CO2 out of the air and then by burning the the biomass and putting the CO2 underground, you in, in, in theory at least, and very much in theory, you remove the CO2 from the air. And this is dominates all of the major models that are informing governments uh, to a very, very significant level. But the problem with biomass is much more chemically variable than coal, and that can have quite a big effect on the chemical processes you use to remove the CO2. And that's been one of the major problems of the Boundary Dam project. The other issue, which I think we have to really seriously think about here, is that carbon capture and storage is not low carbon. The life cycle emissions, even deck sites about over 100 grams, are probably going to be between 100 grams and 200 grams of carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour. And to give you a sense of it, depending exactly how you look at this, uh, new, renewables and nuclear are probably about 5 to 15 grams, so much lower. So if you're serious about climate change, you have to have zero carbon energy. Medium low carbon energy is not good enough. The temperature keeps going up. So but, given the time frame we have in the West to deal with this, carbon capture and storage cannot be one of the por portfolios of our options because our carbon budgets are much smaller than that in the poorer parts of the world. They have a little bit longer, not much longer, to make the transition. So for them, carbon capture and storage could be a temporary um, bridge. I think it's a lot of money to spend on something that would not last for very long, because we have to have zero carbon energy, and CCS will never give you zero carbon energy. I feel, I feel the need to sort of fly a flag slightly for, for CCS. Please, <laughs> oh, fly, fly it yes. as, as I mean, proudly as you but, want. But maybe perhaps just to take a step back, what I really get depressed by is the, is the technology tribalism that we all quickly get into. I mean, we're having the debate here about CCS, not CCS. It could equally be nuclear, not nuclear. Um, there are some people who hate wind, others love it. You know, it's, it's a sort of, it's a massive distraction, actually. And, and really, I am in the camp of all of the above. Uh, as long as it's as low as possible. And so I don't, I don't think you can write off CCS, partly because CCS isn't one technology. You're picking on, quite rightly here, um, the application of CCS on a power station, post-combustion or pre-combustion. There is loads of applications of CCS, and a lot of them are going to be used in much more specified uses when we're trying to decarbonize industrial systems. So, and, and I think you'll also find that it's going to be useful when we come to decarbonize gas. The, the planet is awash with cheap natural gas, I think. It, it, that's, you know, from reading what you can. So we are going to have to find a way of, of taking the carbon out of, out of natural gas. And that's because it's an incredibly useful and very abundant and cheap commodity that I think the world's going to use for a long time to come. So if we want to hit these deadlines, CCS on gas is, I think, going to be an but essential part do of it. it. The, the life cycle it, emission it estimates have always said, even if you had 100% capture, let's imagine you could, it's the upstream emissions that are the problem. So you would always have significant life cycle emissions. Now, every LCA that's been done for this, including DEC's own one, has shown this. Define and them upstream. Emissions. If you define for me what you mean by well, upstream. I mean, that if, you, if you want to extract the gas in the first place, or you want to dig out the coal, or indeed if you want to use oil. Let's forget CCS. coal, because I think coal's no, right. done, really. Well, well, not if you use CCS, why not? Because for the reasons you're pointing out, it's expensive and doesn't work. Well, <laughs> but even if you did, well, 
We haven't tried it for gas. If we tried it for gas, you're we still going to have... People do do expensive things that don't work. Well. <laughs> <laughs> but True. my simple point here is that if we are serious about the two Paris commitments, we have to have zero carbon energy. And, and, I'm, and I agree completely with Brian. Far too many people choose one technology over another, and that is a complete mistake. I don't mind which technology, as long as it is zero or very, very low carbon. And CCS will never be very low carbon because of the upstream emissions. And it's true if you never do it from gas never. as well. No, don't, I mean, A, don't group CCS as one thing. It's not. It's like renewables. There's a plethora of technologies that fall under that category. Really, there is. There's a group outside of Cambridge now currently storing CO2 into aggregate, selling them as breeze blocks. I don't mind that. It's, it's, it's the upstream emissions, not, that, not, the, not that. that anyway, Jan, did you want to come in have, as someone who's worked on yeah. CCS? Um, no, not that you haven't <laughs> Yeah, I just wanted to comment on the fact that uh, coal is too expensive. Well, so the problem is that currently there are four different ways of calculating CCS costs. And one of them is the cost of CO2 um, avoided. And that means that when you compare the cost of coal plus CCS and gas plus CCS, coal plus CCS looks uh, less expensive because you avoid, m l you, you avoid more CO2. And so due to your methodology, then the cost of, C of coal plus CCS looks cheaper than natural gas plus CCS. Whereas if you use other methods, such as the cost of CO2 captured, then gas plus CCS looks cheaper. And so depending on your methodology, you reach a different conclusion. So that's, that's one point I, I wanted to... Yeah, but I, honestly, to share I think with you. Mm -hmm. a, a really important points, but in the grand scheme of things, any technology that's bringing down carbon emissions has got to be explored. And I think there are, as has been said, there's now a much greater interest in R&D into a whole suite of new technologies than there was. And part of it kicked off by Paris, part of it just the fact that people like Bill Gates and uh, Zuckerberg and Elon Musk have actually said, you know, we've made our trillions. We're now, you know, let's let's apply ourselves to global problems. And they've got they've got track records of running globally successful companies, not paying enough tax possibly, but they now are saying, well, I, I can think global because I've shown that I can act globally already, and and that's a hugely important new facet of this of this debate. Kevin, when you, uh, I mean, one of the things that people say they want CCS for is so-called baseload power. Are you a person who doesn't think that a modern system necessarily needs baseload, or are you someone who wants a lot more nuclear in the baseload? How do you see it going? Do you mean the UK or globally? Uh, I'll take either. Okay. Well, uh, firstly, if we are, I, I, everything I'm saying is premised on trying to deliver the two degree C framing broadly captured in Paris. Mm. If we are going to do that, then we need to, well, currently, as I said, I think I said before, electricity can, um, is about 20% of the energy we consume. So 80% isn't. But I think if we're going to be serious about getting our emissions down to virtually zero, then we probably have to have about 80% of our energy needs to be electricity. And the other 20% we can probably muddle through with biomass and maybe some hydrogen production, and maybe some other few, few other things around that as well, maybe some synthetic fuels. So we need a massive level of electrification. But once you do that, what we mean by base load changes, starts to change. So once you put your heating on the system and you've got air conditioning loads possibly in the summer, once you put um, industrial loads on there and once you put uh, transport loads on there, the, the actual dynamics of the grid look very different. And very few people, including National Grid, are looking at very high levels of electric, electricity penetration. Virtually no one is looking at high levels of electricity penetration. They might be looking at doubling. We, what are we looking at? About 350 terawatt hours, slightly under in the UK. They might be going to 700. That uh, might be going to, sorry, 500. No one's looking at, say, 700 or 1,000 or 1,500 terawatt hours, which is really where we should be looking at. And if you start looking at it like that, it looks quite different. Now, on top of that, you need to reduce the energy demand. And on top of that, you need things like smart grids. At the moment, we're not rolling out a smart grid system. We're just rolling out a slightly less dumb grid system. <laughs> we need to really think what a smart grid system might want to look like. And well, it's something fundamentally different to what we're thinking about at the moment. But if you ally these things together, then I think questions about what we mean, mean by base those start to change a little bit. Nevertheless, we want, well, there will always need to be significant sort of um, base chunk of energy. Now, whether that you can get that through through possibly nuclear, through some forms of storage over the next 20, 30 years, or indeed more interconnectors to other parts of the world, to, to Iceland, to other parts that are stronger connected to the EU. That might help us with those base those issues. And just one quick look on the CCS, which I want to do agree with Brian on. Oh, CCS, no, no, no. CCS is pivotal for, pivotal for cement and steel industries. So I think the industry, for the industrial sectors, which we were not going to probably talk about much tonight, we mustn't forget those. The industrial sectors are really hard to decarbonize, mm -hmm. um, particularly cement production from the process emissions. 
And when you talk about the hugely expanded renewables and possible nuclear sector, where do you see the investment for that coming from? Well, I don't, I, I don't see the current way we look at these issues as going to get anywhere other than just tinkering at the, at the edges. What we are talking about, the scale of the change we're talking about, is very similar, I often use this analogy, to the, to the Marshall-style reconstruction of Europe after the Second World War. We will have to be serious about changing the productive capacity of our society to respond in the horizon we have to this agenda. That's why I say it's a jobs agenda. Um, you know, that, that investment is not going to come from the private sector in isolation. It's going to come from governments forcing people. So it's a bit like Roosevelt went into oh, it was Ford or whatever and said, we want you to make some planes. And they, and they said, well, we can't because we're making cars. Says, you don't understand, you won't be making cars. That's the sort of change we're talking about to our society if we're serious about a two degrees of framing of climate change. But we're not. We're just tinkering at the edges with a bit oh. of money here and a bit. But, we, we, people are, some people are tinkering at the edges. Some people are doing really profound things. Like Norway is saying, right, we're going to stop with the combustion engine in cars. You know, that's a forcing motion that the government's taken. Actually, there's a bill coming through both houses quite soon for, in the UK looking at electrification of vehicles and the infrastructure yeah. questions need to be sorted out. Why is that happening? It's not happening by accident. It's because now there's quite a main, there's like a growing momentum behind the idea of electrification. Who's Pushing it well, at least part of it's being pushed by electricity companies who've spent the last decade with a, pretty much a flat demand for their product. Suddenly thinking, well, hang on a second, here comes a growing market. Right, well, let's do that. So you suddenly see electricity companies now eating into the market share of the fossil fuel companies, of the oil companies. On the electrical side, but I mean, Norway is still looking to expand its offshore oil and gas industry and its sovereign death fund. I, I, I don't, let's not diss Norway. I mean, honestly, this is one of the most green countries taking some of the most, I mean, it, it's it's an unfortunate fact that Kevin, everything you're wearing, everything you're sitting around, everything is built from fossil fuels. And you we just you can't just turn off the tap. Now I'm not, you know, I sound like a massive apologist for the industry, but I'm honestly saying they have been paying for everything. Welfare state is just the beginning of it. And you they are incredibly successful at what they've done. They've lifted billions out of poverty and made a lot of people very rich Sorry, in the Norway process. Fossil the fossil fuel industry. Oh, no, I'm not, no, now, I'm not, I'm not so vilifying the fossil fuel industry any more than do many, other, many others of us. So no, I'm not, I do not want to pick a most equal opportunity. Okay. Well, how, how about turning around and celebrating it? I've worked in the fossil fuel it. industry for quite a lot of years, yeah. Yeah, designing and building offshore oil platforms, and there are lots of very good people working in the fossil fuel industry. You should be working on renewables now, but yeah, that's the investment. There's many of them are. How many people here are thinking about, of the young students, are thinking about going to work in the fossil fuel industry? And how many think they might end up in some kind of sustainable future technology talk? Yeah. So, you know, that shift has already happened and they know it. And that's why, really, they are they are looking out now thinking this is this is this is actually an existential risk for them, let alone for us as a planet. Yeah, I think you want to come with them. Then I'm going to go mm -hmm. throw it out to the audience. Um, but I think we all agree that change is happening. Um, what we're arguing is that it's not happening fast enough. And if actually we do care about people that work for fossil fuel companies, uh, we need to start transitioning faster now and have a clear plan on how we're going to reallocate those workers to cleaner companies. It, because well, um, if we wait until the last moment, and as Anthony Hobby mentioned, we could have this um, situation where suddenly you destroy half of the value of a fossil fuel company, and we don't have a clear plan on how these workers can be reallocated to other parts of society, then that is unfair and that's going to have very, um, big, like it's going to damage society and there's going to be resistance to climate policies. Whereas if now we start thinking, okay, we have 15 years to uh, transition towards a two degree uh, business model and all of these workers will have to start working in, you know, Cleaner, cleaner can I, can I give you some, a little yeah. just a vignette that might give you some hope which is that really if you look at the fossil fuel industry that's growing at the moment in the United States it's 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 fracking it's get natural gas extraction they are peripatetic workers they, they, they are people who flock quickly to a, a site which discovers gas make a lot of money and then they move on now these people have the engineering skills which are going to be absolutely essential and can be redeployed into other technologies 
it is not going to happen by the United States having a planned economy and reallocating workers. That is not the political economy of the United States, and it's not the political economy of Europe. Where it is more of a political economy is in China. And thankfully, actually, we should be spending a heck of a lot more time talking about what's happening in Asia, not obsessing about Europe and the US, because there you have a combination now of uh, some of the uh, the long-term thinking that's necessary to tackle climate change and the money, most importantly, the money to be able to make big projects happen quickly. You look at the speed at which they've rolled out their uh, high-speed rail network, their transmission grids, they're now sweeping out of China, out across the Silk Road. China is where it's at, and I'm, actually what I think you'll see, you'll see is that they will quickly realise that they are now gaining both international credibility and their own high quality jobs and investments from taking that path just at the point where Trump starts to really um, destroy growth and good job creation in America and, and that will give them even more momentum. So um, look eastwards is my advice. Okay, I'm looking outwards at people with their hands up um, and I'm going to take um, a few at a time. I'm going to start off with these two. They need to get a mi How many microphones do we have? Okay, you're going to get a lot of work. <laughs> um, gosh, it looks like uh, you first, sir, then you. Oh, I, I don't care which way around. I can... <laughs> Hi, um, I'm what uh, Lord Rees would call a lukewarmer. I, I believe in low climate sensitivity. And uh, looking at the recent literature, the estimate is, estimates of climate sensitivity are coming down. It's also been borne out by looking at the climate change models all of which, with very few exceptions, have been running very hot. Now, I don't see climate change as an existential crisis. I do, however, see a mad rush to green technology as a way to kill lots of people in the third world. And quite frankly, if you look at what's happening in southern Australia at the moment, that will give you an idea of the future of wind power. Thank you. Over there. Over there, please. Yeah, uh, John Gibbons, director of the UK CCS Research Centre. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were talking about it. I, I, so, I mean, Boundary Dam's getting up to speed now. It's only 110 megawatts because it's in Saskatchewan. There's a million people, and they can only build 110 megawatt power plants. They can't. They can't run with just one power plant for the whole. Uh, province they need multiples um, but the, the problem is I, I think actually there's a pretty good chance that we can produce CCS technologies that get to net zero and below and clearly they've got to go to below uh, Bill Gates is funding uh, a greenhouse gas removal technology taking CO2 out of the air which doesn't have some of the limits of, uh, of BEX uh, in Canada uh, it, it's working. The price seems high, but actually you, it, the cost of that technology probably would only double the current pump price for petrol in the UK if you offset the CO2 from petrol. Because you know, that's quite high. That's uh, £600 a tonne at the moment. So that is possible. And I can see that, in fact, we could get some examples of this working, if not by 2020, but fairly soon afterwards. The problem I see is actually getting the whole world to install this technology when it involves spending money just for the sake of climate change. And that is notwithstanding that all of the analyses I've seen suggest that the cost of achieving net zero would be significantly higher without CCS. Double is a, a ballpark figure. But, but it's just this thing, why would you spend money just for the sake of the climate? That, that seems to be the problem. And I, I think that's a, a political answer rather than anything an engineer can do. Okay, well, we look for, there's a question up there, which we'll come to after. We're gonna, um, actually there first, red, red top there, no, that aisle, and then round the back to the gentleman right at the back. But before that, I think the question about um, death and third world is a question about expensive energy uh, modalities against cheap energy modalities, basically. Was that your point? No, I, I think the point is that uh, we're, we're having discussion here which is almost like an echo chamber, and how the angels dance on the head of the pig. Okay, that wasn't, as I understood it, your question. Um, I thought you said killing millions of people. What I'm saying is, given the lukewarm scenario, which uh, I'm speaking about, and I'm speaking about the Australian Greenhouse Gas Commission, which is the 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 
Mm. Yes, you said this, but you also said something about killing people in the third world. I wanted to know what you want there because I want, I, I do want to get to this. Because it's fossil fuels, as I think Kevin Anderson was saying, has lifted so many people. Right. Can we, can we meet? Thanks. Answered. The question here is that there are a large number of people, there are a large number of people still in dire energy poverty. Is it reasonable to deny them the fossil fuels that they need on the basis that climate, that there are still uncertainties, the risks of climate change are uncertain? Yes. Well, I, I've made the point, the point repeatedly. I would like to see the emissions of the poorer parts of the world go up. Because I know that, and I know it's absolutely categorical from repeated scientific work on this, academic work on this, that if they improve, if they increase their levels of energy consumption, then their quality of life also improves. Up until some sort of um, threshold point, there's some very interesting work being done out there. One of my colleagues, Will Lamb, has been involved in that. Above that, you don't get the improvement in quality of life. So I, in the very near term, I expect the emissions, I want the emissions to go up. And that means, I don't know anything about you, but it means that people like me have to reduce my emissions even more. Because, I, because the start of your question about the climate sensitivity, we don't know where the climate sensitivity is. We all we have to do is make our best judgment. You've made your best judgment, and I've talked to my other colleagues in the scientific community, and most of them now who work on this, you know, quite neutrally away from the microphone, away from any grants, are saying they think it's probably nearer the higher end of the climate sensitivity range from what they're seeing. And, and I'm not prepared to take that risk that you may be right and those scientists may be wrong. Martin. Yes. Um, well, I, I completely agree, and I said that in India, clearly we want to get them away from having to depend on uh, burning coal or dung in uh, smoky stoves. Clearly, it, as uh, has been said, they have to increase their emission. But as I also said, the quicker we can develop uh, clean energy to make it cost competitive with coal, the better. And as regards lukewarmness, I really, really hope they're right. It would be wonderful if they were right. But uh, uh, no one can be confident, it's very uncertain, and uh, we should be surely paying an insurance premium to reduce the risk from the worst case. That's the essential argument. Uh, we can't be confident that it won't be serious, and we ought to pay a premium to guard against that risk. Although, it would be wonderful if the lukewarms were right. Barney, I wanted to bring, to bring you in on John's question about um, how do you get people to do things just for the sake of climate? Because we had an interesting example here on the panel earlier where Kevin was saying one of the great things about a, a, a vibrant climate policy would be that it would be a jobs policy. But what about things that don't do anything for anything but the climate? Is there a political answer there or do you always have to find some sort of like near-term cofactor to put into your, to put into your equation? Uh, well, I mean, you know, I, I'm famously critical of economics as, as anything like a solution to climate change. But there is, there is, it is just the fact that if you make, if you attach a price to an emission, which is otherwise emitted freely, if someone can come along with a technology that says, you know what, I can give you a certificate that says I have buried a volume of emissions, you know, scientifically signed off by the National Physics Laboratory or whoever, that can then be traded into a market and used as equivalents to, to so so that so there are mechanisms that there are some bits missing and and famously the European emissions trading market doesn't actually allow that separated out capture and storage part to be traded into the market and could be easily fixed and it doesn't so you so there are ways in which CCS could come to market without needing to have you know sort of self-sacrificing planned government saying oh, I'm going to do this um, I think and I think. Where you'd see that come would be in the sectors like cement, where they're facing, you know, very rising prices. There's no way of escaping that in Europe. And um, eventually, I think it's around 15 euros a ton. People like Lafarge say they would then move into chemical sequestration um, using different feedstocks. They don't, you know, they'd start looking at a whole range of options. So, so it can it can happen. Where I think, you know, your, perhaps your question is around: Are we going to see? large-scale pipes built out into the North Sea and huge, you know, Drax scale volume of emissions being buried at cost. I think that if that were going to happen, it would have, it would have happened by now. And I think that, that sort of boat has sailed, unfortunately. Okay. Next question. Um, my question is related to political will. There's lots of technical solutions. There's lots of experts have different perspectives, but this is a fixable problem. What is not fixable at the moment is the political will to deliver the technical infrastructure that you can argue about. We actually have to look at 
equity transfers between one part of the world and the other, and you've, t you've mentioned that in terms of emissions in the third world. We have a huge dependency on what comes into this country. The carbon emissions of our electricity is not the big deal. It's the embedded carbon in everything, and the embedded water for that matter, that comes through our ports. We have a dependency on an infrastructure right the way around the world. And we have to own that, and we have to deal with that, and we have to reduce our dependency. To do that, you have to persuade people to have less. And we have a society which everything tells them they should have more. Our entire mechanism is to consume, and if we stop consuming, everything falls apart. We have to actually address that question to enable all these technical discussions to be implemented. And without that discussion being owned by people of our intellect, we are not going to make any progress. The technicians work in Paris, the technicians work in the industry. I've been working for 30 years on corporate social responsibility. I can write a business case. You can't deliver a business case to a consumer in a UK supermarket. You have to talk to them as people and as citizens, and I'd like to hear who's going to do that. Okay, um, over there. <laughs> and while we're waiting to get over there, we have been on the internet to uh, Kevin in New Zealand, um, who would like to ask, um, uh, actually, not quite the same question, and I'd like you to address that question, particularly about talking to people about the needs to consume less. But um, Kevin would like to know about just show about this problem of procrastination. And when will we show its emergency? Martin has already said probably not for a long time, but I'd be interested to hear from anyone else. So urgency, communication like that, and third question there. I would like to ask something about something that's been said before regarding the thing that the TTIP can be something wrong for the for the climate for the climate because of the fact that of course the companies are competing to produce the same product under different legislation in terms of energy. So I'm wondering if there is, instead of going against the liberal market or whatever, there is, is there any chance we can use the CE mark to defend the climate? And what I mean is like, is there any chance that is it possible to put on the CE mark? So if you want to sell in Europe and um, set for each kind of product, a kind of limit in terms of kilograms of CO2 produced in the manufacturing process. Is this something that's already happening or is something that can be done? Okay, right, I'm gonna to go to those questions now. The next question will be from the lady in pink there. Um, so, what would actually bring about the sort of urgency that Kevin feels we need? What is the experience of talking to people about needing to consume less? Martin. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I mean, my concern is that people would not realize it was urgent unless and until it was too late. If 20 years from now it's clear that the carbon percentage is high, uh, then people realize that then it may be too late to avoid uh, tipping points, etc. So that's the bad news. Uh, that's why I think the best hope is to develop technologies so that we can segue towards a low carbon economy without people feeling their they're suffering or suffering loss, then they'd be happy to accept that. Um, but I think as far as attitudes are concerned, I mentioned uh, trying to maintain public interest and using religions and all the rest of it, um, but I think there have been changes in public opinion uh, um, over sort of drink driving um, and smoking and things like that. Um, and in the same way, we may be able to uh, uh, get uh, people to change their attitudes so that uh, driving a four by four is seen as naff rather than stylish, and making similar changes of that kind uh, to make uh, extravagant use of energy uh, something that people are ashamed of rather than willing to do. That will help a bit, but I am pessimistic about any urgent action if people are going to feel it's to their detriment. Kevin, can I come to you on that? Yeah, there's, there's quite a lot in those questions really to unpick really. Um, I think, I mean, given this, this is partly a memorial of David Mackay. David Mackay thought the numbers in the analysis were important, and I, I think that I would hold to that. And we have a very clear 
uh, sort of uh, guidelines from the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel, and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, as to how much carbon we can emit to hit the carbon, the, uh, the Paris objectives. And if you start to look at those, and if you start to think about the issues you made before about issues of equity, the wealthier parts of the world have got to sort of lead on that. Actually, you cannot get away from the fact you cannot build the infrastructure fast enough to get us down the curve with technology. So technology is a prerequisite, but it will never be able to deliver the Paris commitments, never. And that, therefore, you come back to the point, well, what can you do in the interim to get the emissions down? And that is to reduce our energy consumption, to consume less. But when we have to consume less, we're not saying everyone has to consume less. I mean, it comes back to this point before about the poor parts of the world may see their, may see their energy consumption go up. I would rather hope that the poor people in the UK whose children suffer bronchial problems living in the five million homes, little four to five million homes in the UK that have been fueled poverty, that their energy consumption goes up and their emissions go up initially. But that means, of course, that others of us, the 50%, the, sorry, the 10% of the global population who are responsible <coughs> for 50% of the global emissions, that we have to take a much, much bigger hit. So it's, it's a very unappealing message to say everyone's got to consume less, but it's also wrong. It is actually that some people have to consume, a small group of us have to consume much, much less. And we've normalized our lives. People like me think my life is normal. It is completely abnormal within the UK, let alone at a global level. So we have to unpick that. And then it becomes much more of an issue of equity, that the poorer people may well see improvements in their quality of life. They may see themselves buying more stuff, you know, living in better houses with more heating. And others of us have to make much more significant reductions in the near term. Of course, this is very hard to sell, because who's got to put that in place? Those people like me, the policymakers, you know, the, you know, the, the lawmakers. But I think the question... So it's a big issue that, that we have got to try and guide, guide our own behaviours. The people who sort of sit at the front of the panels have got to change our behaviours. And because we don't want to do that, and that's why we're reliant on technology. But how does the... I mean, going back to the question, if I understood right, how does the conversation with someone in John Lewis where you're saying all these things that you are buying have carbon embedded them, have energy embedded in them, have water embedded in them, how I does that... I don't think John that, Lewis is the problem. What? I don't think John Lewis is the problem. Well, they but, laugh. No, but I was... Sorry? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm being facetious, but actually it's, it's, the, it's the primarchization of, you know, you buy something, you throw it, like the famous anecdote of seeing someone walking down Oxford Street, the Primark bag opens, clothes fall on the ground, they just keep walking, because it's the act of buying, not the act of, of using the clothes that, that people are addicted to. And I, I suppose, again, I don't... I don't want to come across as the eternal optimist, but I do think the generation coming up behind us has your generation and below, they may well have completely different uh, views of consumption than we do. And we might find that we start to consume differently, not less. So I think that you're going to see an electrification of our, of our consumption. Already, a lot of people gain the same dopamine hits that we may get from buying something physical from trading a, a, a photograph or, or some other form of interaction that we... Uh, at this you know, age of 45, I can't really understand. But I, I, I suspect there are big trends coming through that mean that we will be dematerializing some of that consumption just by the way that we're changing our society. But th th that gentleman up there, though, refers to the sea <laughs> mark. I think that, I mean, that, that gives you one way out of it, possibly. You could use, so I don't think people who are in Lewis's or Prime, or wherever they happen to be, really want to think about what's, what's the carbon footprint of this. And I don't think it's their job to do that, to be honest. I think it's the role of the government to put in a regulatory framework so they choice edit for you. So the only things that are sold meet the appropriate standards. I don't think we should spend our whole lives, every waking hour of our lives, thinking about climate change. It's okay if it's my, that's my job, so I have to do that. But for most people, that's not what they want to be doing. I don't think it's what they should be doing. There are plenty more worthwhile life, things in life to be doing. And that's why I think standards and regulations are there to take that effort away from everyone else. But if whilst we have incredibly weak standards, we're not going to bring about the sorts of changes that are needed. I mean, I, I agree. I don't like the idea of Primark and, and all this stuff people are buying. But this is a climate change agenda, not a social agenda. I only want to change things socially if it's related to the climate. And if we can actually have people still go to Primark and buy the crap that they sell, um, but it's low carbon crap, then at the moment, from a climate perspective, I don't want to try and stop that. As a citizen, I may have my concerns about that being an unsustainable, inappropriate practice. There's, there's what, sorry, I can't just, what, what, how do you feel about these ideas of generational shifts in patterns of consumption? Um, I mean, I think there's definitely a shift in how we consume, but um, in a sense, more and more of us just go on a weekend away because plane tickets are so cheap and it's so easy to go somewhere. So, yeah, but you know what? I don't think, I really don't think we're going to roll back the idea that we can fly. 
I mean, it's part of human development to be able to do that. And I, and I really, I totally disagree with the idea that that should be the first thing we should be thinking about. Honestly, it's amazing that we can get from one side of the planet. It creates a global sense we of community. We can't. Most people don't fly. The we yeah, that, means to, people like you actually, and me. Actually, more and more people can fly. Yeah, but most people can't. The, the flying is driven by a small group of people like us. We, drive, we fly far more regularly. If you look at all the data on this, it's not the poor flying lots more. It's the rich flying a hell of a lot more. And then to sort of say, well, we can't manage without flying. Most people manage perfectly well without flying. I don't, I just, I'm sure they can manage. I'm it's, just saying I don't want to choice edit the fact that we've, we've no, as human yeah, race, yeah able to fly. I mean, but, that's ridiculous to say that that's got to be off the agenda. No There'll be ways, that. well, you, well, could, I mean, you I, could be forgiven for thinking that it's a, you know, it's an evil thing to want to get on a, fl it's on a plane. It is emblematic of, the, of people like our behaviour. Uh, Peter Kalmus, who's a climate scientist in the States, wrote an interesting piece that he stopped flying two or three years ago. He stopped flying because he just looked at his own emissions and he was completely shocked that over 60% of his emissions came from his flying. And my guess is probably that Maybe this is an odd audience, but most of the audiences you talk to in, in universities, actually, their emissions are very similar. It's emblematic of high emitters, is the flying. Okay, I'm going to go for a couple more questions. We're running very short on time because I've been a lax chairman. I'm going to have three questions, and I want them to be fast and specific questions, please. Thank you. I have two. No, what you're going to have one. <laughs> <laughs> one. What, what is, well, then I say this, I ask the second. <laughs> What impact on climate has have warfare emissions? It is never mentioned. So what nature of emissions? What warfare? impact war has okay. war have warfare emissions on climate? Okay. It is never mentioned. Okay, thank you. Uh, there was a question down here, I think. Okay. Yes. Uh, Brexit emissions of war. Of war. Of war. Of question over there. Uh, during World War II, large numbers of well-off people in Britain were persuaded to um, reduce their consumption and it was considered that was done by shaming people and also by people feeling that it was a genuinely good thing. So kind of a combination of those two things. So it is possible in some circumstances to persuade people with a lot of money that actually they, they will voluntarily take a big hit in their standard of living. So that could be a possible, it's okay. not as easy as that, but it's a possible, Gentlemen it can be back. done. Yeah. Uh, this discussion has all been about consumption per person. I just wonder whether you see any role for population size in this discussion. <laughs> Okay, we have four questions, we have four panelists. Um, uh, so we have two on warfare. What are, the what are the climate costs of warfare? And what is the, in the great phrase of William James, what is the moral equivalent of warfare which would make wealthy people willing to make sacrifices for climate? What are the effects of Brexit? And should we in fact be talking about population? I'm willing to have any of you go for any of them, but they're all four gonna be answered, one each. So whoever goes first gets their one first. I do Brexit. Okay, go on Brexit. <laughs> I'll do Brexit in two minutes flat. Um, obviously, um, the biggest impact of Brexit at the moment is it's just soaking up all of the political space. I mean, it, it, there's, you know, there's civil servants are being deployed onto it. There's, it's just soaking up a huge amount of time in terms of uh, the government's thinking, the cabinet discussions, legislative agendas. Um, so it's, it's going to slow things. But I'll just give you one example of why it, we will carry on acting uh, irregardless, and it's a bit of a plug for the Climate Change Act, is that on, I think it was May the 30th, which was one of the more extraordinary days in British politics, in one of the more extraordinary weeks in British politics, when um, Gove stabbed Johnson in the back, Johnson had to pull up. That same day, the Climate Change uh, Act required that the government accept the advice of the Committee on Climate Change for the fifth carbon budget, that exact same day. And so that, so that metronome of activity that flows from the Climate Change Act will carry on because they're legally obliged to do so. And I think that's, so Brexit will come and go, it'll be depressing to live through it, but the timescales in the Climate Change Act will see us through that and the, the legal points that have to be met will be met. Okay, warfare, warfare, and population. <laughs> Don't all rush. <laughs> well, uh, You're taking population? Yeah, I do. Okay, population. Yeah. Well, Unless you were about to do... Well, I was going to do 
population. I mean, of course, let's bear in mind that half the world's population, as we've heard, are producing only 10% of the CO2 emissions at the moment. But of course, it's obvious that if the world population gets uh, very high, then that's going to increase not just CO2 emissions, but all kinds of pressures on the environment. And the climate, the population of the world is almost certainly going to rise to 9 billion by mid-century. But after that, uh, it's more uncertain. It'll depend on the uh, choices made by people who as yet haven't had children. And I think for all kinds of reasons, we've got to hope that the population does not rise above 9 billion. And if anything starts going down after 2050, because if it doesn't, that's going to aggravate all our problems. Okay, and with some, uh, which, which way are we going for warfare and warfare? <laughs> Kevin, do the impacts of warfare on the climate. <laughs> well, I've heard the population one. Um, because I don't think population matters, but anyway. Um, uh, they probably do, but they matter for two reasons. That one is that we will forget this. Now, I tried to get some funding for this a few years ago. We could not get any funding to look at the emissions from, um, from the military. That we were looking at the military as a, a, a way of ensuring a secure supply of oil. So we wanted to, we wanted to add a carbon footprint onto the onto the carbon footprint of oil when you buy petrol or diesel to say actually this is the bit we have to spend in you know in bombing parts of the world and flying our planes over the top to get the oil in the first place. So we want to try and work that out. But we couldn't get any funding for it. Um, but I, <laughs> so I think there are two parts to the emissions here. One is the emissions of warfare, and that's really hard to get the data on that. And someone's told me recently it's, it's actually not available um, for the energy consumption used by the military. But the second part is that. Actually, that, what, what, what do we use the military for? We have repeatedly used the military in, to some extent to help provide us with secure oil supplies. And therefore, I think it is important when we think about that, when we buy a litre of fuel, you're not just emitting the litre of fuel, you're, emitting, uh, you're also emitting the emissions from the planes and the forces that were used to maintain that secure supply system. So we never look at it from that system perspective. But actually, what those numbers are, um, I'm not sure that anyone's done any detailed work on that, or in fact that the data is actually available. Shan, the question, and I don't know more, more broadly, it comes back, I think, to the urgency. How do you make people, or how do you allow people to feel that they should make a sacrifice for this? Um, well, fortunately, I know the etymology of the word sacrifice, <laughs> uh, which is that you give up something to get something better. Um, so I guess what we need to do is create a vision uh, where people feel that it's worth it and that they're contributing either to the greater good or it's a, it's a duty as a citizen for them to reduce their consumption. Um, and so we should reframe the debate because currently we're having, you know, we're talking about oh, gloom and doom and uh, the earth is going to be destroyed, etc. Well, we need to offer a positive vision of the world and, um, yeah, make Thank them you. realize that it's a duty. Yes, that's great. Thank you. And I can't think we'll find a better note to end the evening on. So I'd like to thank you all very much for coming. Thank you all to our panelists. I understand there will be another series of lectures next year. Who knows what delights are still in store. But thank you all very much indeed. Thank you.